वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर अनिता भेला फ्रॉम द यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ डेली एंड टूडे वी विल बी स्टडिंग मैथ्यू आर्नल्स एस ए द स्टडी ऑफ पोइट्री दिस मॉड्यूल हैज बीन प्रिपेयर बाई डॉक्टर ज्योत्सना पाठक ऑल्सो फ्रॉम द यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ डेली वी नो दैट मैथ्यू आर्नल्ड वॉज द फॉरमोस्ट क्रिटिक of the 19th century we also know that he put a high value on poetry in this particular essay he deals and talks about judgment and evaluation of good poetry he places poetry in a much higher rank than that of the disciplines of religion of science of politics and of theology he tells us that poetry serves a special function in society and that it can serve to civilize society and give it moral values matthew arnold the foremost critic of the 19th century critiqued and commented on cultural and social issues religion and on education he was the first to pose questions within the context of modern industrialized society he felt as a humanist that man in industrial society was condemned to a mechanized existence and was leading a fractured life both spiritual and moral let us study the characteristics of arnold's criticism he critiqued the obsession of his society with utilitarianism and with reason he did not believe that science was offering anything good to mankind and he rejected the growing scientific temper he was mainly concerned about the manner in which people could live fulfilled lives in an industrial society and he makes an attempt to move from the exteriority of the bourgeois existence to an interiority of the self for arnold poetry and culture become modes of interiority in order to nullify the exteriority of bourgeois existence let us have a look at some of the salient features of matthew arnold's essay the study of poetry the first important thing to note about the essay is that the essay is not meant for the professional men of letters but rather is directed towards the general middle class reader who has some interest in poetry it also contains some of the best known pronouncements of arnold about poetry and poets in fact it is an essay that deals preeminently with how to judge and evaluate good poetry in the essay arnold as i mentioned earlier claims a very elevated very high and elevated status for poetry he places it over the disciplines of science religion theology and philosophy why and how does he place it above these disciplines he believes that all the other fields of science of religion of philosophy and of politics are full of charlatanism what is charlatanism it means that people try to create a confusion between that which is good and desirable and that which is fake and harmful so that people do not have a clear idea about what is right and wrong or what is good and bad why 
Thus, he considered religion as charlatanism. He says that religion has been threatened by science and it seems to fail to address the fundamental questions that have been facing man and therefore it has reduced its status in the eyes of the populace. Additionally, religion has placed meanings on facts which are proving to be incorrect and false. Why science as charlatanism? Because science is being falsely presented as the new arbiter of knowledge, which he thinks it is not. Philosophy should, be not, should not be considered charlatanism, but he does consider it. Why? Because he thinks that it is itself grappling with certain unresolved questions and problems and therefore it is incapable of providing moral and spiritual sustenance to man. Above these disciplines, what is the importance of poetry? Arnold believes that the ideas that are presented in poetry are infallible. He thinks that only poetry can offer spiritual and emotional succor to man. It is the only viable method, according to him, of interpreting life truly. But if poetry is to serve this great a purpose in society, then we have to have a very higher order of excellence. Our judgments of poetry has, have to have much higher standards than that of the other disciplines. And the parameters which we apply to the judgment of poetry, again, should be much higher than those we apply to other subjects. Since poetry can sustain and delight man, that it implies or it follows that the best poetry only should be created and should be read. When there is trouble, then it is poetry that sustains and delights man. Therefore, it is imperative that the reader be extremely critical and conscious about what he or she is reading. Reading certainly influences the mind of the reader and therefore the reader should be constantly judging whether the poem is for his benefit or not. The reader has to read a poem very carefully to identify the true caliber of the poet as well as that of the poem. It is only after this that the reader can actually choose to accept or reject the poem. How is the reader to judge a poem? When a person is reading a poem, he should be able to identify whether the poem is good or bad. He should be able to tell whether the work falls short in terms of language and meaning. And he should concentrate not only on its good points, but should also try to discover its faults. The reader needs to bring objectivity to his analysis of the poem by avoiding what Arnold terms as historical and personal fallacies. What is historical fallacy? Very often we judge a writer or an artist by his reputation, either because everybody appreciates him or because of certain biographical details that we that are known about the author or uh, because the author has put in a lot of effort in composing the poem or that the poem has become important because of the role that it has played in national politics or in national literature. Therefore, through 
these kind of judgments or these kind of readings, we may actually be giving greater significance to works that they actually do not deserve. Now, Arnold says that this historical fallacy is generally, uh, it's the work of literary men. And uh, some of their ideas may be lost, you know, lose meaning and validity as time goes on. Of course, the danger is that these men of letters may posit false model or as ideals that should be emulated and should be followed. Then Arnold goes on to a particular work to tell us how this historical fallacy might be at work. He refers to the work Shansun D. Roland. It is a 12th century romance. It has a number of good qualities. It has verve and it has freshness. But the prime importance of this work is linguistic in tracing the growth and development of the romance. Therefore, it has been given an exaggerated importance as a result of the philological groundwork. What is personal fallacy? Personal fallacy may be based on a flawed personal intimation or estimation of a poet or his work. It originates either in personal liking or in certain circumstances. And generally, it occurs with contemporary poets. Arnold tells us that in order to sift the good and the bad poetry, we must apply the touchstone method. If we go back to Sydney's An Apology for Poetry, we know that he tells us that poetry is superior to history because history can only tell and it cannot be fictionalized. Whereas the poet can fictionalize history to create ideal characters. Arnold also tells us that poetry is superior to history and he quotes the ancients. And he says that the ancients too considered poetry superior to history because it presents both truth and seriousness. Arnold says this, there should be no abstract system of judging poetry. And therefore, he foregrounds his touchstone method. He tells the reader not to go by any abstract system, not to take the opinion of others, but to go by his own critical taste and judgment. Arnold believed that all reasonable people, without going by any absolute standards, can agree on the quality of the poet's artistry and evaluate his criticism of life. Arnold's notebook suggests that he followed this principle and applied the touchstone method because in his notebooks we find noted thousands of passages of poetry which he used for his touchstone method. He said that the reader, instead of referring to some critic who will give him some abstract ideas about what is good poetry and what is bad poetry, the reader will not be able to judge. Rather, it would be more useful if the reader keeps before him lines by the greatest poets of the English language and these lines should serve as his guides while reading poetry. He can compare and see which is better. He has to compare to judge the worth of what he is reading. Arnold's touchstone poets 
are Shakespeare, Milton, Dante, and Homer. The touchstone method helps a reader judge quality and quantity. He can judge the poetic worth with res which resides in matter and substance. And also he can judge the poetic worth which re resides in manner and style. Arnold feels that if there is a high degree of matter and substance in a poem, then it will automatically be co communicated in a high degree of manner and style. He believes that matter and substance of a poem exist if it has high truth and high seriousness. The manner and style of a poem lie in its style, in its diction and in its movement. Now we will see an example of Arnold's touchstone method at work. He applies the touchstone method to Chaucer. Arnold compares Chaucer to the French poets of the 12th and 13th century. He believes that Chaucer gave a lot to English poetry in terms of rhyme, meter st and stanza formation. He believes that Chaucer is superior to the French poets. He stresses the fact that Chaucer presents a humanistic view of life. He says that there is liquidity of diction in Chaucer's style and there is also a sound representation of things. He had a great influence on the English writers who came later on and therefore is rightly called the father of English poetry. Yet, in spite of all these virtues, Arnold does not consider him a classical poet like Shakespeare or Dante or Homer. Why? Because he thinks that Chaucer lacks the seriousness that is needed to be classified as a classical poet. He judges Gray and finds him a frail classic. Arnold then comes to the 18th century poets and he says that the 18th century poets believed that they had produced great works of poetic merit because they made many innovations and developments in poetry. But Arnold finds this claim to be incorrect. Why? He says that the years following the restoration are characterized by a rejection of the Puritan ethic. It took the form of rejection of the spiritual life of the period. The new age required a prose that had regularity, precision and uniformity which the poets provided. Though the prose of this period had this, the verse is lacking and is suppressed. The verse heralds it as it being the age of reason. Now, if we actually uh, evaluate what Arnold has said, we find that he lauds the many qualities in Chaucer, he lauds the qualities in Gray, but he does not consider either a classic to be used for his touchstone method. Arnold gives us the example of Burns, the 18th century poet, to show us the pitfalls of personal fallacy. He appreciates certain qualities in Burns. He says he talks about life of the Scottish world. He represents it and there are certain good qualities in his poetry. But a reader who is not familiar with the Scottish world may not be able to understand or 
<clears throat> participate fully in what the poet is saying. Arnold also feels that Burns' poetry, in Burns' poetry, there is an application of ideas of life. But he is unable to achieve high seriousness. He says, there is a tendency in Burns to preach and he compares him to Dante and finds him wanting. And he says that Burns is the greatest example that we can find of a poet being given undue merit and worth because of the personal fallacy. In the concluding part of his essay, Arnold compares Chaucer and Burns. He thinks that Chaucer possesses a verb and an energy and a pathos dealing with human life that seems to be lacking in Burns. The charm of poetry that is present in Chaucer seems to be lacking in Burns. Let us sum up what we have studied today. We have come to know that Arnold assigned a very high status to poetry. He placed it over and above the disciplines of science, of philosophy, of theology, of history, of politics. Arnold also tells us that poetry serves a very important function in society. It contributes to civilizing life and giving it a moral direction. In this context, he tells us that since poetry has to serve this important function, it becomes imperative that we apply high standards for judging it. And the standards that we apply need to be much stricter than those which we apply to the judgment of other disciplines. The method of judging poetry that he tells us about is his touchstone method. He tells us that we can take certain classical poets, that is Dante, Milton, Homer and Shakespeare, who can serve as our models. He says, the reader need not depend on the judgment of others regarding what he or she reads. He can trust his own taste and judgment. But in order to judge and evaluate poetry, he must apply the touchstone method. Only then can he establish and know what is good poetry. For further knowledge, you may read the e-text and thank you.